Hey everybody, welcome to today's lecture. Before we jump in, I just want to say a massive thank you to La Trobe University and all our other sponsors uh, who really helped to put these lectures on and make them happen. Would also encourage you all to check out the La Trobe Aspire Early Entry Program. Definitely worth looking into uh, and learning about how that can help you. Now let's jump into the lecture. Hi everyone, welcome to the Specialist 1-2 lecture. Uh, we'll just get started. So, welcome to the HR Notes lecture series. My name is Michelle, I graduated in 2018 um, and I'm currently in my final year of med right now. So just a quick thing about HR Notes. So, we've been around since 2007 and we just want to make sure students like you can thrive by offering as many free resources like these lectures and things like that to help you as much as possible. And it's HR's Notes mission to make sure to support students like you. So please do check out the resources available. We've done these lectures um, since 2015 and we've been doing a bit of online and in-person lectures in the last couple of years. So it's been a really good time and um, hopefully you benefit a lot from them. So these are a couple of the resources that HR Notes offers uh, just to have a look through it there's a lot of free notes free videos free guides and really from anything whether you're a visual learner or if you want something more in text there's definitely resources available for you and there's helpful tutors as well all on the discussion forums to help you with anything that you need like that and if you need a bit more help we've also got our HR notes um, kind of services so we've got our Tute Smart, our AG Unlimited and our study guides. But for now let's get started into the lecture. So like I said my name's Michelle, I graduated in 2018 and doing final year med. Alrighty, so how this lecture is going to run today is we'll have two blocks basically um, because we won't there won't really be a break between the blocks but do feel free to pause and have a bit of a rest if you would like to. Um, but do ask lots of questions and if there's any questions that you have questions about please do upvote them um, and if there's anything in particular that you want to, to be asked or if there's anything within the chat that you think you have the answer to do feel free to contribute to it um, but otherwise yeah ask as many questions as you want because I think questions are the way to learn. So let's get stuck in. So we'll have trig and coordinate systems in the first block and then some more coordinate systems and then talking a little bit about vectors. Righty, so let's get stuck into trig. So the the trig definitions for us is our Sokotoa type thing. So we have our sine, our cos and our tan and the acronym is Sokotoa. So that's how we can remember it. and if you can remember this triangle, it's really helpful because when we talk about exact angles later on, it means that you don't have to do pure memorization and you can actually use these properties to help you find whatever the angle you need to find. And you, that means that you don't really need to memorize the table, but you can do that if you'd like to. So it's Sokotoa, so sine is opposite over hypotenuse. We have cos, which is adjacent over hypotenuse. And then we have tan, which is our opposite over our adjacent. And the main thing to recognize is because of the relationship between sine and cos, if we were to place this angle here, so as long as this is a right angle triangle, if we were to place this angle here compared to here, the values would be the exact same, but they would just swap. For sine and cos because we're just essentially swapping the j which side's adjacent and which side's opposite and with the tan we'll just get one over that value. Cool so let's talk a little bit about our unit circle and what that is. So our unit circle like the name suggests it's a unit of one so it's a circle that goes from one negative one one negative one right and that's how our kind of unit circle is going to be measured. So the most important thing is that the positive angle is measured anti-clockwise, so it goes this way, whereas the negative angle is measured clockwise. I'm not sure why that keeps on popping up. Um, so in sh essentially the main thing to remember is that it's always anti-clockwise from the positive x-axis, so that's something that you can make sure to remember. And 
another thing is that if you want to measure negative angles you can go in the opposite direction alternatively there's another way to write it where you can kind of go all the way around and then you can write it that way as well so we talk about angles generally between 0 and 360 degrees or alternatively 0 to 2 pi but you'll see when you go through methods or special or whatever essentially you talk about angles in any cycle and you can have multiple cycles to get to the same angle and you'll get the same result so as long as you you know if you're going all the way around then you end up in the same place that it was before that's totally fine you'll just get the same value for it so uh what's an important thing also to remember is that there's there with the different quadrants different qu different things are positive or negative in different quadrants right so there's a couple of different ways to remember this and you can really use whichever method you think works the best for you but i used cast so c-a-s-t another thing you can also recognize which makes you means that you don't have to remember an acronym is that with our negative one one negative one remember it's literally just a circle and we know which side is the positive direction of the x-axis and we know which side is the negative direction of the x-axis right and similarly we would know which one is the positive y-axis and which side is the negative y-axis so using that knowledge we can actually try and figure out which side is positive and which side is negative so evidently this is not as helpful with tan because tan doesn't have a direct equivalent but for sine and cos because what we can do is essentially this the cos component will just be this component here right and then the sine component will be the component up here so because our sine is always our vertical and our cos is always our horizontal essentially what we can say is when we're on the positive direction of the x-axis we can say cos is going to be positive all on this side of the graph and cos is negative on this side of the graph because it's the negative side of the x-axis and generally that does correspond and so if we look here now and we're thinking sine we can see sine is going to be positive up here and negative down here so that's kind of how it works and that's a way to remember it as well uh, you can come up with essentially any acronym you like i think cast works well and as long as you remember what each of them are so in this quadrant cos is the only one that's positive in this one all of them are positive in this one you have your sign being positive and this one you have your tan being positive and that's essentially because your cos and your sign are both negative and your cos and your sign are both positive here so those two quadrants it's positive in so essentially in every rotation every rotation going like this there's going to be every two pi there's going to be two quadrants where sine is positive two quadrants where cos is positive and etc right. so let's talk a little bit about the exact angles and you'll need to know this both for special and for methods so it's something quite important for you to know overall so there's a couple of different ways to actually memorize this uh, and it's really up to you which way you do want to memorize it but the key thing here is that you pick a way and then you just kind of know it. so there's kind of three ways that people talk about so the first way is going to be talking about this table method right here the second method is going to be talking about your triangles and your third method is going to be talking about your hand method all right so We'll go through these two today with the hand method. Uh, look it up on YouTube. It is quite interesting how they do it, but essentially it's based on the five fingers and you kind of base it on which angle. So you choose one side to be one angle and you choose one side to be cos and one side to be tan and all that kind of stuff. And then from that choice, essentially that leads you to be able to recognize which one kind of from your fingers counting over your fingers it allows you to recognize like whether it's like root two uh, root three or root one and you kind of can figure it out from there so that's kind of a good way to memorize it especially if you're comfortable with using that method and you can memorize it quite well and you know you like that method quite well personally I'm a little bit biased I guess because I really like the the triangle method quite a lot because I think it's quite handy and quite easy to do and it requires the least memorization but the table method definitely is also quite useful especially if you have a lot of angles that you need to figure out that you can't really be bothered with just doing each individual triangle for and having a look into that so 
essentially with the the sign cos tan ones what you want to do is you want to make sure you recognize when sign is zero and when sign is one right so if we look in our unit circle and we look where sign is so sign is our vertical we can recognize that when we get to pi on two which is one fourth of that circle we're going to get to that is going to be one and this part's going to be zero so working the other way around we can recognize that cos is going to be zero here right and sine is just going to be cos is going to be zero here and then sine is going to be we cos is going to be one here and sine is cos is going to be one here and cos is going to be zero here right so we'll have one and zero so you've got your equivalent so far now the way to do this is essentially you just count upwards so you go root one root two root three and all of these are all going to be on zero I mean sorry all going to be on two so two 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 so what that actually gives you is root two on two you can either simplify that to one on root two or leave it but you can definitely simplify the one out right so i'll just be a half in that section there and then you just do it in the opposite direction for this one so you essentially it's just going to be root three root two and root one which is just one all over two and that's how you can mem like memorize those angles another way you can also do it is if you look at the like on the sides as well if you want to memorize which direction it goes in so if you, as long as you have your angles in ascending order and you can just remember sine is ascending and cos is descending so you go root zero root one root two root three root four and root four is just two so two and two is one so that's how it works out and then you can go root four root three root two root one and then root zero right so then with tan what you do is because tan is just sine over cos so essentially you pretend to like divide over a line so one over zero is just going to be zero one over root three is going to just be one over root three or root three on three then root two on root two is just going to be one and root 3 on 1 is going to be root 3, and 1 on 0 is going to be undefined. And this is where our asymptotes occur for tan. So that's how you can memorize it. Another way to do this is using the triangles, uh, which essentially you have two triangles. You have one triangle, which is your pi and 3, pi and 3, pi and 3, and you have one triangle, which is your pi and 4, pi and 4 triangle, right? So what you do is this is an equilateral triangle, and what you do is you kind of cut it in half right so if because we're cutting it in half the easiest thing to do is just use two but if you wanted to you could use any number you really wanted to for our purposes two is probably the easiest but you can make up a number if you don't remember right? if you don't remember it so we can go with two and then we chop it in half so this becomes one and then using pythag we can figure out this is root three so now you've got this angle on here which is going to be your pi and six angle so i.e. half of your pi and 3, and this one's still going to remain your pi and 3 angle. And then from there, you can essentially just use Sokotor to figure that out. And then with this other triangle here, it's going to be an isosceles right angle triangle. So we can just use 1, 1, and using Pythag, we can figure out that's going to be root 2. And so what we'll get here is this is just going to be pi and 4, i.e. 45 degrees, and you can figure out all the other stuff from there as well. Cool. Amazing. Alright, so... There's a couple of things that they talk about, like I guess the complementary and the supplementary angle rules. So the main thing with these ones is you don't have to memorize these because these ones are less, like you can kind of figure them out by using the unit circle and figuring out which quadrant it sits in. Uh, that's because essentially, you know, your pi minus x and your pi plus x, that's just going to be up here or down here. So you can kind of figure it out from there. So these are essentially just saying what they're equivalent to because these are, so if you imagine this is in the fourth quadrant, this is in the second quadrant, and this is in the third quadrant, which we talked about how using the cast acronym that tan was positive in third, sine was positive in second, and cos was positive in fourth. These rules here are quite helpful because they 
they're called the complementary angle rules and essentially what they are is all centered around this pi on 2 property sometimes you'll see stuff with like 3 pi on 2 and stuff as well but it's essentially just this except plus a pile and so you do this part first and then you can kind of move pile do whatever you need to from there but essentially if you imagine kind of what we were talking about before about the triangles and how the sides and the cos just flip based on where the angle is which one is the adjacent which one's the opposite that's exactly what's happening here right so if we had an angle x here before and now we're having pi minus x it's going to be the angle up here pi over 2 minus x so it's just going to swap swap the angle so we can kind of see those two make sense right because within the triangle it just switches which where it sits in terms of the pi on 2 plus x it's I guess a little bit more complicated because you can see that the cos goes to negative sign instead and that's essentially just because if you imagine where pi on 2 plus x would sit it'd sit about here right so instead of your triangle being like this way it'd sit up there and that's completely okay but just remember that cos was going to be negative in this quadrant in the first place. So what that means is now because cos was going to be negative in that quadrant, the sign that's going to be resulting from that is also going to be negative. So it's just something you have to keep in mind. Uh, and essentially, if you just imagine what the, it's the same thing that they've done with the angle up here. So they've just essentially switched the angle, switched the focus of the angle, so that instead of you having theta, instead of you having x here you're going to be thinking about this angle pi on 2 plus x so the angle down here will be x and then from there you can kind of use that if you were to minus pi on 2 get pi on 2 minus from that you would get once again that pi on 2 minus x up there and you'd be able to switch it over so if you think of it as it essentially is our pi on 2 minus our x, that angle here, so essentially here, pi, pi on 2 minus x, so essentially the angle in here, and then you've plused your, plus that back in, you can kind of imagine that goes to here instead, and just the main thing to remember for this one is why this cos goes to negative sign, was because cos was going to be negative in the second quadrant, whereas second second sign wasn't going to be negative in the second quadrant in the first place cool yes all right so let's evaluate a couple of these exact angles so we can evaluate them either with the triangle or we can evaluate them with the table so let's do one with the triangle one with the table so we'll have a triangle here it's 60 degrees so i'm going to use this triangle here where i have 90 degrees here i'm going to have 60 degrees here and I'm going to have 30 degrees here, so this means that it's my equilateral triangle that's been chopped in half. So it's going to be 2 here, 1 here, and root 3 here. So what I get is it's going to be so ka toa so opposite over hypotenuse. So I want my sine 60, so it's going to be this one here. So I want my opposite over my hypotenuse, which is going to be root 3 on root root 3 on 2 so my sine 60 degrees is going to be equivalent to root 3 on 2 all right so tan negative 5 pi on 6 so because this isn't in our normal values i guess it isn't in the first quadrant values we can kind of reevaluate. so in terms of negative 5 pi on 6 that's going to be here isn't it going to be negative pi because we're traveling pi in the opposite direction to the positive direction so here's going to be negative pi so what we're going to have is it's going to be not yet reaching that and it's going to be here so that's going to be negative 5 pi on 6 right so if we get negative 5 pi on 6 here what we're going to get is that it's going to be pi on 6 left over there so that's the triangle that we're actually going to be working with and we just have to figure out whether tan is positive or negative and using our cast we figure out that it's positive so we can use that so this we're going to say tan negative 5 pi on 6 is going to just be equivalent to tan pi on 6. And essentially we are, let's just use the same triangle rather than writing it out because it uses the same triangle. So tan pi on 6 is equivalent to tan 30 degrees. And because the, the kind of the transition between the two is that if you want to go from degrees to radians, which they sometimes do a little c, 
Let's say degrees, radians. So if you want to go to degree from degrees to radians, what you do is you divide by 180 and times by pi. If you want to go from radians to degrees, what you go do is times by 180 and divide by pi. So essentially, whenever you, if you just divide whatever the value is by 180, you'll get how many pi's you need. And for this one, so if we wanted to convert it, divide by pi, get 1 on 6, 1 on 6 times 180 is 30 degrees. So we can look for tan 30 degrees, and tan 30 degrees, according to this, is going to be our opposite over our adjacent. So our 30 degrees is 1, right, over our adjacent, which is going to be root 3. So we're going to get that. It's going to be 1 on root 3 or root 3 on 3. Coolios. All right. So moving on to a bit more complicated angles now. So these are called the compound and double angle rules. And they're very important because they come up, they will come up now and then haunt you basically forever until the end of VCE special because they are used a lot in circular functions evidently. But they're also used a lot in other contexts as well, particularly with calculus questions. They're also used a lot for those. So I think it's really important that you get these down well. And because they're on the formula sheet, you know, it means that you don't particularly have to memorize them. But I'm under the theory or I'm under the like, I support the theory that if you can be comfortable with these rules, it's probably better that you have some vague recollection of these rules rather than just f solely relying on your formula sheet. And that's only just because of the reason that it will probably make you more efficient at doing questions. So, and it will make you more efficient at doing questions. And I think it will also make it better in terms of recognition for questions which aren't so straightforward in terms of they tell you that it's going to use the it's telling you that it's going to use circular functions. So question like calculus questions. So if you can do that recognition, it's helpful to know what's going on. And it's more helpful that you can recognize what's going on so that you can do the question and recognize what rules you need to use. Cool. All right. So we've got two questions here. We have cos 75 degrees and sine pi on A. So cos 75 degrees is going to be equivalent to cos of 75 times pi on 180 so that's going to be equivalent to cos of 5 pi on 12 right because essentially you're going to have 15 divided by both and if you divide 15 into 180 it'll give you 12 and if you divide 15 into that you'll give you 5 pi on 12. So that's the angle we're going to get here, right? That's the angle we want. And we want to think about this. So the key thing with finding exact angles, which you don't have an exact value for straight away, is you want to identify what this can be made up with, right? So 5 pi and 12, the pi on 12 things are probably the most common ones that come up with this. Just because if you think of the angles we do know, it's pi on 2, pi on 3, pi on 4, and pi on 6. And if you think of the lowest common denominator for all of those, it's going to be pi and 12, right? So if we think about what we could do here, this would be 6 pi and 12, this would be 4 pi on 12, this would be 3 pi and 12, and this would be 2 pi and 12. So our goal is to form this. So our goal is to form 5 pi and 12. So we want to work out a combination of these which form 5 pi and 12. And the easiest combination we can probably see here is just plussing those two angles together, which makes our life very great in terms of just using those two angles. So what we can do is just use those two and we can put those in. So we're going to use pi and 4 and pi and 6 here. Let's rub dub dub. So what we can do is we can say this is going to be equivalent to cos pi on 4 plus pi on 6, right? So for how I remember cos and sine rules is the cos rules are always cos cos sine sine and the sine rules are cos sine cos sine. So because the sine rule comes from sine, Sine will always take the first angle in the rule, so it will always be sine, cos, sine, cos, 
right? So if this was a sine 1, it would be sine pi and 4 cos pi and 6 and then plus cos pi and 4 sine pi and 6. So it's kind of the sine takes the preference there. But for cos, the main thing to remember is because it's both cos cos sine sine, the main thing to remember is which one is positive and which one is negative. And how I remember it is that cos cos, because it goes cos cos, it's always going to just be the opposite sign. So cos plus cos will just be minus in between, whereas if this was a minus, it would be a plus in between. For sine, it's going to be the exact same sign because it's going to just have sine cos plus sine cos or sine cos minus sine cos depending on which one depending on whether it was plus or minus in the first place so it'll be the exact same sine 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 goes to sine right so with the cos what we'll have here is just cos pi on four cos pi on six minus sine pi on four sine pi on six so what we're going to get here is if we think back to uh, or we can do our table method here maybe uh, let's do a really mini table so whoop, whoop. one two three and we can just not include our other ones so that we can focus on these ones so we can go pi on six pi on four pi on three and then this is sine and this is cos so it was our cos pants was root one root two root three and this was root three root two root one right and they're all over two sorry it's a bit hard to see it's a bit tiny i think that's okay all right so cos pi and four we can see here cos pi and four is going to be root two on two and then cos pi and six is going to be here which is root three on two and then here is going to be minus root 2 on 2 for sine and then sine pi and 6 is root 1 on 2 so root 1 on 2 right so we're going to get this is going to be root 2 bracket root 1 minus root I mean root 3 minus root 1 over 2 so i is just going to be root 3 minus 1 times root 2 over over 4 sorry not over 2 over 4 and that's our final answer. So you can kind of see it doesn't look that gross, but it is definitely more gross than the actual angles we work on. All right. So this one's a bit of a different one. And how I like to call this one is kind of doing like a half angle thing because we know what sine pi on four is. And we also know what cos pi on four is. What I recommend so that it doesn't get too mixed up is just use cos pi and four because cos pi and four has a lot of really nice rules. As you can see here, there's a lot more rules for cos pi, sorry, not cos pi and four, cos two x than compared to sine two x. There's a lot more variation in rules and you'll see that your cos two x is often more helpful. So I'm gonna use cos pi and four here and I'm gonna say cos pi and four is going to be equivalent to cos 2 times my pi on 8 and what this will mean for us is that when we're going to put that in right we're going to put that into our cos pi on 8 2 pi on 8 and what you're going to get here is that we can kind of equate that in so we can do this and essentially say that this is going to be equivalent to our cos rule here and we can just use one of these if we wanted to find the sine one we can use this sine one here so it's going to be 1 minus 2 sine squared uh, 2 sine squared x, right? Or you could use, yeah, so you can use this cos 2 pi and 4, and then you can essentially use this one as your rule to put it in. So what we're going to get here is we're going to get this one, so it's going to be 1 minus 2 sine squared pi on a as our value, right? So then what we can do here is essentially we can just substitute our cos pi and 4 in, which we know is root 2 on 2, root 2 on 2, and we can just essentially solve like a quadratic equation from here. So we'll get that this is 1 minus root 2 on 2 will equal to 2 sine squared pi on 8. And what we can do here is just do that from there. So we'll get that this is going to be... 2 minus root 2 on 4 will equal to sine squared pi on 8. So therefore, sine pi on 8 
will equal to plus or minus root 2 minus root 2 on 4, right? So let's go up to here because there's no more space. So it will be sine pi on 8 will be equivalent to. And what we can use here is that pi on 8 is going to be bigger than 0 and smaller than pi on 2. So therefore sine pi on 8 has to be bigger than 0 because it's in the first quadrant. So what we'll get here is that it will just be the positive version and it will be root of 2 minus root 2 on 2. And we can kind of root the 4 so that it doesn't. Generally, people don't like surds in the denominator, so that's the only reason why. Cool. Amazing. And you can do the same thing for, like, cos pi on 8 or whatever. Righty. Let's move on to these ones. So these ones are essentially the trig identities. So you have the addition of angle rules, you have the double angle rules, and then you have these trig identities. So this trig identity should be quite familiar to you. This one also reasonably so, it's just derived from the Pythag theorem, if you think of the triangle that we form, this side is cos and this side is side, so it kind of makes sense to why this cos squared plus sine squared. These two you, you can remember, but you don't necessarily have to remember, because they just are derived from this one. So what you do is you, for this one here, what you're going to do is divide everything by cos. So if you divide everything by cos, what you're going to get here is sine squared over cos squared is going to just equal tan squared. Cos squared over cos squared is going to equal to 1. And 1 over cos squared is going to be sec squared. So that's where this one comes from. And for this one, what you do is you divide. So this is divided by cos and this one is divided by sine. So if you divide everything by sine, you will just get this sine over sine is 1. Cos squared over sine squared is going to be cot squared. And 1 over cos squared is going to just be, sorry, 1 over sine squared is going to be cosec squared. So that's where this one comes from as well. So you can kind of see how the two rules were derived from the, those two aspects. Cot is just 1 over tan x. Sec is going to be 1 over cos x. And cosec is going to be 1 over sine x. So you ask me, why why couldn't they have just made 1 over sine x equal to sec x and 1 over cos x equal to cosec x? Trig is, trig the, the idea of trig is to confuse people, so that's why they did it. Um, no, I'm joking. I, I'm not sure why it is, but you can just remember that it's the opposite because most things in trig are just kind of the opposite of what you think. Righty. So let's have a go at this question then. So they say sec x equals to negative 3 on 2, and x is bigger than pi on 2, smaller than pi, which means that it sits in this quadrant here. So they want us to find what sine x is, which means that we don't actually need to find what x is, we just need to find what sine x is, which is helpful. So what we can do here is we can identify that sec x is 1 over cos x. <coughs> Sorry. 1 over cos x, which equals to negative 3 on 2. <coughs> Sorry. Don't know why I just got a sneezing fit. Um, 1 over cos x, which equals to negative 3 over 2. So we can kind of swap that over and say cos x will equal to negative 2 on 3. And then if we want to find sine x, we can just t take it from the identities that we found before. So there's kind of two ways to do it, actually. So there's one way you can do the triangles here, or you can find it via the identities. So we can try finding it via the identities. So cos x plus sine squared x is equivalent to 1. So if we plug that in, negative 2 thirds squared plus sine squared x will equal to 1. So you'll get that this is going to be... 4 on 9 plus sine squared x will equal to 9 on 9. So sine squared x will equal to 5 on 9. And sine x will equal to plus or minus root 5 on 9. So they've told us that x is bigger than pi on 2, smaller than pi. And we know, in, according to our CAST acronym, that sine sine is positive in that second quadrant and it sits in the second quadrant so therefore you're going to get sine x will equal to root 5 on 3. Okie dokie. 
right um the other way to do it is you can use triangles so you can essentially just do this and say this is your triangle and you're going to just ignore the negative and positive when we can work that out later but you're going to say that your adjacent is two and your opposite is three and you can kind of work it out from there as well so theta so you're going to have nine minus four and it's going to be root five and you can kind of see how you can work it out from there as well cool all right for the function with the rule fx equals 96 cos 3x sine 3x, find the value of a such that fx equals to a sine 6x. So this one might look a little bit complicated and it's only worth one mark, but it's actually relatively straightforward. So all we need to do here is essentially recognize that this component is essentially just going to be the sine 2x rule. All right, and we know sine 2x is going to be equivalent to 2 sine x cos x so we need 2 here so what we're going to get here is going to be fx will equal to 48 times 2 cos 3x sine 3x and we can just treat the 3x as if they were if they were x so all we need to do is double them so what we'll get here is 48 times our sine 6x so therefore we're going to say that a is 48 just like an important exam tip overall is that always look back to what the question is asking because sometimes you put in the hard yards and find and you put in all the stuff and you're working out is absolutely wonderful and you do everything that they need to and this particularly applies to questions where there's like functions and they're like oh yeah so there's a b c d and then they get you to find the function and you found your a you found your b you found your c you found your d you found all the pronumerals you find and you just leave it right and you're like, yay, and you move on. But then what happens is you'll lose a mark because they ask you to find the function and you didn't actually write the function in the end. Or you didn't write it in function notation. Or they didn't, you wrote out this, right? You converted it into the form that they wanted it in, but you didn't find the value of A. So it's stuff like that are really important and stuff that it, it, it's things to lose easy marks on, which you don't really want to do because there will be things which are difficult and you don't know how to do. And if you lose marks on that, it's okay because you didn't know how to do it and you'll find out how to do it for next time. But stuff like that is really hard to stop for next time because, you know, it's a practice of what you're doing. So it's important to start building that exam technique really early on. Okie dokie. Alright, so let's talk a bit about the sine cos cosine rule now. So those were kind of... So there's kind of like two aspects to trig. There's the first aspect of trig, which is all about those angles, finding exact values, finding values and drawing out your sine, cos, tan graphs, doing all of that, the reciprocal graphs, all of that kind of stuff. And then there's like this side of trigonometry, which is more about geometry and talking about shapes and what's going on with shapes and stuff like that. So... I would say the aspect which is more accessible is probably the, like for next year, for this year both of them are accessible evidently because both of them are part of the study design, but for next year if you're thinking about in the future and the concepts which might carry over, the one that's going to carry over the most is probably the ones that we just talked about in terms of the angles, drawing them out, stuff like that, because it is very applicable for trig it is sorry very applicable for calculus type topics as well this topic still a little bit in 3 4 but not as much so what you'll see in 3 4 is they'll use this as assumed knowledge so they'll use this as the assumed kind of geometry knowledge because there's a lot of geometry involved in spec by nature because there's vectors as a topic and all of that stuff involves shapes so by nature it is a topic which kind of gets assumed knowledge from geometry so with these rules even though they're not strictly in the three four study design what you want to know is just vaguely have these rules on your formula sheet and or not on, like on your band reference and what i recommend for this end of year exam as well is to have one list full of just all the geometry rules that you come across that are used so stuff about parallelogram stuff about squares rectangles triangles 
circles, all that kind of stuff, and just have a general repertoire of those types of things because even though they might not be assessed as like a sole thing by itself, they will definitely come up in the context of other questions where you technically could use another method to help you, but it's often easier just to use that method to do it and you've already got a nice tidy rule to do whatever you need to do. All right, so let's talk about the sine and cosine rule. So there are essentially three main rules uh, that are about triangles, right? So all of the triangle, all of the stuff we talked about so far was mo all in the context of having right angle triangles, and that was talking about our graphing, all of that type of thing, all of the finding exact angles, you know, using our Pythag rules, lovely stuff. But there's also another side of kind of trig, which is all about the triangles, which aren't the right angle triangles, right? So your isosceles triangles or your scaling triangles or just just your random equilateral triangles as well that aren't anything that doesn't involve a right angle. You know, even if it does involve a right angle, these are still applicable. But I guess it kind of cares for the side which doesn't have that right angle thing in there. So, what we're going to have here is the cosine rule is used when there's two sides and an included angle, or if three sides are given. And what it is, is it's going to be a squared plus b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. So, for example, for this one, if we're finding, so, it just, the main thing to remember is that it's the side that you want that corresponds to the side of the angle, and the other things are just kind of inserted in in between so the main thing to remember here is that you have your a squared here and you want your that angle to correspond so that's why it has to be an included angle alternatively so if you have if you have the three sides given what you're going to find is the angle and if you have two sides and an included angle what you're going to find is the side so what we have here is that we have our a squared you know and then what you have is your b squared plus c squared and you'll see when we talk a bit about vectors that this formula kind of looks a little bit similar to the vector formula as well and they do have overlaps and you can use the vector formula to help you prove this formula as well cool so the sine rule it applies when we have one side and two angles given so i.e a kind of angle side angle situation or if we have two sides and one non-included angle and if we look at that triangle so essentially the sine rule is based on you need so if you kind of cut this off so it's normally either one or two you normally don't have three things that you're finding at once so if you think about what you're trying to find right you're going to have one unknown so that means that you need to at least have one pair of stuff and then you have one value for one of these. Because how the sine rule works is it's kind of like a ratio type rule. So the ratio of the side to its angle is going to be equivalent to the ratio of the side to the other angle as well. So that's how it kind of works. And the, what's the most important is that you have at least one pair. If you don't have one pair, that's really problematic because you can't really do anything. So for example, if you had A sine C and then you had B and yeah, if you had, your, if your three pieces of information was A, B and then sine C, you can't really do anything with that information in terms of the sine rule. You could do something in terms of the cos rule because you have a, b, and then the c, but you can't really do anything in terms of the side rule. So it's most important is that you recognize which rule to use because like we saw before, it is possible to convert between sine and cos quite easily just using the Pythag rule that has sine and cos within it. Cool, let's go through some examples. So if we have find a b and capital a so we want a b and capital a if we know b equals to 60 degrees so we can kind of draw this out so we don't doodle all, all over the triangle in the corner it 
with these triangles they can be any shape you want they can be weird they can be wonky they can be really look like anything uh, and the whole point is try not to make your triangles look too nice because if they look too nice sometimes our brains get tricked into looking at the sides and we're like Ooh, those two sides look equivalent and then for some reason our brain makes them equivalent so it is actually better to make your triangles a little bit weird and wonky so we're gonna go a b c and then we'll have c a b so they want us to find a b and a big a so b is 60 degrees c is 40 degrees and little c is going to be seven so they want us to find a b and stuff so what we can see here is that we have one pair so we have c and c c and c here and we have our b left over as well so what that means to us is that this will enable us to actually find out what our b value is so what we can do here is therefore we can find what our b value here is so what we can get is that we'll get that this is going to be b right b over sine 60 i.e sine capital b is going to be equivalent to c which is 7 over our sine c which is sine 40 so we're going to get b is going to equal to 7 sine 60 over sine 40 and often these will tell you you know how ma however many decimal places so what you can do is you can just plug it into your calculator and the most important thing about the calculator used for these is you have to set your calculator either to radians or degrees i would recommend to set it to radians because i think it's easier if you, so if you're in degree mode it's really difficult to type things in radians but if you're in like it's really difficult and it's also you're a bit unsure because if you start type something like 2 pi it might take it as 2 pi degrees so i.e. 3.14 degrees so I find it easier to set my calculator in radians because if you want to write in degrees in your radians mode all you have to do is put the degree sign there and it will automatically calculate as degrees so what we can do here is we can go sign 60 degrees right times our 7 over our side 40 degrees and what that's going to give us is it's going to give us that b will equal to 9.43 dot 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 it normally will be to one or two decimal places so let's go with 9.43 okay so then you ask me okay so we found our b how are we going to find out a and a because they don't directly give us any information about a and a but what we also know, another important piece of information that we know about triangles is that all angles in a triangle will add up to 180. So if we look at this triangle, the angle that we're missing here is 80 degrees, right? Because we need to go 60 plus 40 and then 80 degrees here. And you can see how off scale the angles in this triangle are, but that's fine. So what we'll get here is that A over sine 80 and we can right away actually say that a is 80 degrees so a over sine 80 is going to equal to and i like to still use the same one i used before so the sine 40 because it's always better to use information that you've already got rather than information that you found so a will equal to sine 7 sine 80 over sine 40. so if we kind of plug that in what we're going to get is, we can use the th previous thing that we just did, we'll get that A will equal to 10.73, approximately. Cool, amazing. Alright, so that's kind of an example of the sine one. And let's do a bit of rubber dub and talk about our cos one now. So we can go erasing gold slide. Alright, so find A if A equal to 6. B equal to 10 and C equals to 5. So now we can see that we've got three sides and we're trying to find one of these angles. So really they could have asked us to find any one of these angles, right? Because we've got all three sides. But they asked us to find A, which is perfectly fine. So we're going to go 6 
All right, so the rule is a squared equals to b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. So what that's what we're going to put it in. So we're going to have 6 squared equals to b squared, which was, I think, I'm not sure whether b or a, oh no, b was 10. So 10 squared plus 5 squared minus 2, 10, 5 cos a. Okay, so then we can do a bit of rearranging and kind of switching around. So we'll get 36 will equal to 100 plus 25 minus 100 cos a. So we'll get this is going to be negative, oh no, 89, yeah, negative 89, because when you put that across it's going to be 11, and then 100 across is going to be negative 89. So or alternatively you could go to 36 minus 100, which would be 64, and then 64, ne sorry, negative 64, and then negative 64 minus 25 would have been negative 89 as well. So that's going to equal to negative 100 cos a. So therefore your cos a will equal to 89 over 100. So a is going to be equivalent to. And then you can do a bit of a cos inverse type situation to find out your 89 over your 100. And just remember if you're in radian no mode in this thing, you need to convert it back to degrees. So you just times it by 180 and divide by pi. And it will give us that A is going to be 27.13 degrees. Uh, and you can find the other sides as well from that. So you can find, you know, you can do this side or that side. doesn't matter too much. Uh, so you could find B here as well. And all you need to, would need to do is replace that. Kind of switch around the sides a little bit so you can find it. So those are the first two rules. So there's three rules kind of in total in this topic. The last rule is to related to the area of the triangle, right? So essentially the area of the triangle is just going to be a half BC sine A. And it's going to be based on the principle of these sides as well. And probably derived from the other two rules in order to actually find the area. But you can kind of see how that would work out also. So let's go through this one example together again. So find the area if A equals to 55 degrees, C equals to 35 degrees. So 55, 35, and A equals to 7, right? So what we can do here is what we want to do is find the area of these ones. And what we know is we need a half BC sine A. So that means that we we need to know what these other two sides are going to be equivalent to before we can really do anything. So there's kind of an option here. We can either do, you know, we can either do this one where we, if we, so there's kind of two options here. We can either convert it so that we find what this side is because we don't really need what side C is if we're using the side C angle. And we can do that because we can know what B, the sign, the B angle is as well. And we can convert that. Alternatively, we can also use this ratio to find out what these two angles, find out what these two are, and then just use the 55 degrees. I think the more trustworthy one, the one that requires less working out and less things going on, is probably going to be the one where we just use the angle, we find out what this angle B is and find those two sides, then we use C as our primary angle. So let's do that. So what's we've got that 180 minus, minus 55 degrees minus 35 degrees is going to equal to our B value, essentially. So 55 plus 35 is going to be 90. So what we're actually going to get here is that B is going to equal to 90 degrees. So that kind of changes things because that will mean that this side is going to be the, uh, which we'll call it, the, like just the, the, two, the base and the height. So we technically could use that as well. But we can actually use that idea to help us kind of check what we're looking at right because we've identified that 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 b value is actually going to be 90 degrees so 
let's just find out what B is going to be then. So B, B over sine 90, so i.e. 1, is, I put in too many things, sorry, <laughs> too, many, too many degree signs, is going to equal to 7 over sine 55 degrees. So what that means is B is going to equal to sine 90 over sine 55 degrees. So if we put that into our calculators, what we're going to get is uh, so B will equal to 8.55, let's say 8.55, so round to three decimal places. And so what we can get here is therefore if we want to find this value, what we're going to get is that the area will equal to a half BC. So B, C, our B, C in this case will be these two. So it will be 8.55 times 7 sine 35 degrees. And so we can put that in and just check what that is. So even though I've rounded it off on the page, I haven't rounded it off in my calculator. So it just means that my answer will be more exact. And it's important to make sure not to round off as you go. So even if you write it as something that's already been rounded off, it's important that you kind of leave it unrounded in your calculator to make sure you get the most exact value as possible. So you'll get that the area here is going to be 17.156 or 17.16 essentially. And you can kind of check that via if you... So if, for example, you found what C was here, which would have been, so if you found what C was, which would have been C equals to sine 35 degrees over 7 sine 55 degrees, which would have been sine, so 35 degrees. So yeah, so you would have gone sine 35 degrees and then you would have gone that that equals to 4.9 something, right? And then we identify how this is a right angle triangle. So technically we could just use a half base times height for this and the height is just C. So it's a half C times 7 because base height. So it would have just been a half times 4.9 times 7 which would have worked out to be... Four point nine times seven over two. So it, yes, it would have also worked out to be seven point one six, which we would have expected, right? So you can kind of see how it works both ways. Cool. Let's try our second example on this, and I'll just clear the page before we do that. Amazing. Cool. So we find the area if a equals to three, b equals to six, c equals to eight and you have that B equals to 35 degrees. So you probably could have found what this was based on those kind of angles already. Um, you could have, yeah, you could have definitely found those based on what those angles were already, but they've kind of given us a little bit more information to help us, which is really good. Cool, so because they just want a half B, C, sine A, what we can do is it will just be a half BC, so those two, 3 8 sine A, so sine 35 degrees. And what you'll get here is we can just times that across and it'll be a half, so our 3 times our 8 times our sine 35 degrees all over 2. So you'll get that this area is going to be 6.8829 dot 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 or 6.88. Amazing. All right. So that's trig in a nutshell. Uh, and we'll move on to talking a little bit about coordinate systems now. So the next couple of topics is coordinate systems and then we'll talk about vectors. So essentially a coordinate system is how we represent a point on a 2D plane. So 
what we want to do is we essentially can represent it in two ways. We can either represent it as latitude, longitude type thing, or alternatively, we can also represent it as it is this far away from our origin point. And so it's this far away. And then we can also talk about the degree that it is away. So, you know, it's at a degree of, let's say, 45 degrees to the plane and it travels, you know, how much is that? Like four in that direction. So we can either use that longitude latitude or we can use that distance angle type situation and that kind of gives us our polar or our Cartesian forms. So when we use our functions in like our normal universe what we deal with is we just deal with our like we just deal with our Cartesian universe right? And this will become particularly relevant when we're talking about like complex numbers, which is the the system where we use our polar numbers for. So that's the whole idea of it. So we will use our polar systems when we're kind of dealing with vectors and complex numbers, which are two of the newer topics which have been introduced, or not newer as a new to the study design, but new to one new to people doing one two. So you will have not seen vectors or complex numbers before you do one two spec, and if you only do methods, then you won't won't see it for your entire VC educational career, I guess. But because they're quite new topics, there's also going to be a bit of limited amounts that we actually do in each topic. So the but the one important thing that's kind of common to both of them is that use of that polar system to talk about either distance. So in vectors, we'll be talking about the magnitude and then the direction. And in complex numbers, we'll be talking about in polar forms. So there is a polar form for complex numbers. So how we convert polar to Cartesian is essentially we can just use x equal r cos theta and y equals r sine theta. And the reasoning behind that is essentially because if you imagine like our plane that we did before and we have a point here, Right? We can kind of draw like a pretend triangle there and because the triangle is going to be right angles to the axis we can essentially have like an angle here so we'll say that you know it's 45 degrees of unit 3 or what was it unit 4 before and so we know that this line would have been 4 or for our purposes it's going to be R which is like the radius per se so that how much it's radiating out so if we use that right if we know what R and theta is so if we want to kind of talk about that point in Cartesian form, so you want to find the x, y, essentially your x will be along here and your y will be along here. And one way to find it is just using that Sokotoa, right? So Sokotoa. Because our x is just going to be our adjacent and our y is going to just be our opposite. So our adjacent over our hypotenuse, so x over r is going to equal to our cos theta. And our y over our r is going to equal to our sine theta because it's our opposite over our adjacent. So you can kind of see how that's converted to this. And then in terms of Cartesian to pull, so the other way around, so if we draw our axis again, and then we have, you know, a dot here, and we know what x, y is, once again, we can draw out a bit of a triangle. And if we wanted to find what that r, so how much it needs to travel to get to that point directly from origin, we can just use Pythag, so that's, x squared plus y squared so a squared equals to a squared equals to b squared plus c squared and that's just derived from there and because our r is always going to be a positive value because it's radiating it's just telling you how far it's moving and then our theta there's a couple of different ways to do this you can divide it by r as well but probably the easiest one which requires the least assumptions in terms of you've done your values right is going to be the tan one so what you can do is you can just make the tan inverse because your theta is going to be here once again and it's going to be y on x your opposite over adjacent and so you can just do tan inverse of that and use your logic as well to figure out whether it's supposed to be you know an obtuse or an acute angle so we can kind of think about this so they want us to convert this following thing this following function into a Cartesian form. So what we can do here is we can say that y equals to r sine theta. So that's going to equal to 
this tan theta sec theta times our sine theta, right? So what we can do is we just go our sine theta times our 1 over cos theta, because that is our sec, and then times our sine again. So you can kind of see how this these two would kind of go to sine squared theta at the top, and the bottom would go to cos squared theta as this, if we think of the where it sits in the triangle, you know, or sorry, where it sits in the unit circle, it's going to be here, right, and cos is positive in that direction anyway. So you're going to get cos squared, sine squared theta over cos squared theta, which is the time. Let me just clear that sheet. Erase all ink. So then for our x component, we're going to do the same thing except times by cos. And so we're going to have the cos cos cancel out there, and it's just going to be sine over cos left over. So we're going to get tan. So if we wanted to write it in Cartesian form, or convert it to Cartesian form so that it's a function instead, you would just get that y will equal to this and x will equal to this, so y will equal to x squared. Alternatively, if you're looking at this um, in the first place, you could, so you, you can just go, like, kind of put it into the two directions and then just equate them. So you can see how we can get functions from the same thing. And so we will never be expected to graph funky things like this, fortunately. Uh, they are really cool to look at though, definitely. So although we won't be expected to graph stuff like this, sometimes you'll see it draw on the pages already and they'll tell you, oh, this is a thing, right? Uh, so it's good to like kind of just have a play around with Desmos and stuff just to recognize those different types of graphs. Okie dokie. Alright, so then how can we represent a path of a moving thing on a plane? So we can represent it via a function, right? So normally when we're in the Cartesian form, what we say is, you know, this bus is moving this way and we can kind of represent the path using a function type form. So we can do the same thing um, with we can do the same thing with all of the stuff that we've learned so far, so the polar stuff, right? And even more than that, we can also introduce the concept of having an exact position as well. And what that is going to be called is essentially using a paradigma to help us tell us what's going on. So instead of writing y in terms of x, just showing us what the path is, we can actually also find where at what time it's going to reach that path, right? And t is going to be our parametric variable or our parameter. So what we can do is when we want to convert, right, the easiest thing to do here is essentially what you want to do is look at your y and x and your goal is to get them. So there's kind of two ways to do it and it just depends which type of function you end up having. The first way to do it is what you want to do is get your everything in terms of your parameter. So t equals to something, t equals something. So t equals to something in terms of x and t equals to something in terms of y. So that's one way to do it. And then you kind of equate them and then mix and match until you can get y in terms of x. Another way to do it is that you make them so you can identify a relationship between them. And this often applies when you're dealing with stuff like the trig stuff, so sine and cos. And that means just that you get stuff in terms of sine, get stuff in terms of cos, and then you can use your trig functions to kind of combine the two together. So generally what you want to do is you kind of want to eliminate stuff from both options. So you essentially can just substitute it back in. And then sometimes you can use trig identities as well. Um, so one thing is that you will also see stuff sometimes which aren't relations, they are, these are aren't functions, they're relations, so stuff like circles or ellipses or hyperbolas, so things like that just mean that you won't really be able to get, you know, you won't really be able to get x, y in terms of x in a nice form, so it's okay to leave it in a form which is a bit more complicated as long as it is the correct form for that type of relation. So for example, for a circle, it is absolutely great and fine to just leave it as like x squared plus y squared or vaguely in that type of form. You can also do it by recognition as well, but it probably uh, like, oh sorry, you can also, when you're converting back, you can do it by recognition, but 
also you can just essentially put in a parameter in some point so often with relations with circles there's kind of structured ones in terms of how you can do it so for example circles they use a lot sine and cos uh, for ellipses or hyperbolas often they might use sec or tan a little bit for other things like parabolas and stuff you can probably just make it up and as long as you have as long as you have the correct ratio of the variables it doesn't really matter either way what you're really doing just use the simplest one you can think of okay cool so let's talk about this one so the point moves according to the parametric equation x equals to t minus 2 and y equals to t squared minus 4t plus 1 show that the cartesian equation of this path is x squared minus 3. so I think that the easiest thing probably to do here would be to work on both of them uh, and then put it all together. But for our learning's sake, we can just make our t in terms of our x and then kind of substitute it in. So what we're going to get here is that our t will equal to x plus 2 and we can substitute it in here. So y will equal to x plus 2 squared minus 4 x plus 2 plus 1. So you can kind of see I'm just substituting wherever t is sitting with our x plus 2. So what we're going to get here is we can expand it. So x squared plus 4x plus 4 minus 4x minus 8 plus 1. So what you can see here is our, we've got our x squared. Our 4x's cancel out, so they're gone. We have 4 minus 8, which is negative 4, and then plus 1, which is minus 3. So you can kind of see that how that happens here. Alternatively, another way to do this is you can say t equals to x plus 2 and then do a complete the square on that one. So y will equal to t minus 2 squared minus 4 plus 1, right? So you'll get that y will equal to x plus 2 minus 2 squared minus 3. So y will equal to x squared minus 3. So same thing. Either or is fine. Alright, so another thing about this is we need to talk about like intersections, right? So there is a distinction between when we talk about whether the paths will intersect and whether the things will collide. So how I like to think of it is if they will collide, right? It's like you and your friend go out you're going to meet up at a certain direction at a certain time you tell them okay we're going to meet at i don't know 10 30 at Flinders street station right that's where we're going to meet so you guys are going to collide because you have told them the time and you've told them the exact place as well so you will meet at the exact same place at the exact same time compared to that if your paths are intersecting that doesn't mean that necessarily you'll be there at the exact same time. All it actually means is that your graphs will cross. So, for example, you pass through Flinders Street at 8.30 to get to school. And then your friend coming back from, you know, coming back from school, they pass through Flinders Street at 3.40 uh, after school, right? So you pass through the exact same point, but you're not you're not colliding because you're not there at the exact same time, right? So that's kind of the difference between the two. So if we ask us for paths intersecting, all we need to do is find the equations of each path and then just essentially equate them and see if it's possible to get an equation from there, right? If you want them to colliding, they must be at the exact same place at the exact same time. So you need to equate each component and then check from there. So we can do that. So let's say, so for our points A and B. So let's work out our two equations. So X will equal to 2T minus 10. Y will equal to 3. X will equal to 2. Y will equal to T plus 4. Right? So... We can kind of see how this one will not really do anything in terms of its x value and like these won't both of them won't depend on each other right because you can see how these ones are both separate so therefore our goal now is going to be checking whether these two can equate or not so 
2t minus 10 will equal to 2, right? So 2t will equal to 12, so t will equal to 6. Now, we do y plus 4 now. So y plus 4 will equal to 3. 3 will equal to, t will equal to negative 1, which is not possible, right? Because it will never reach 3. So therefore, they will not be, never be able to be at the same point anyway. Because if we want these to be at the same point, it must have t values, which we can have the exact same coordinates for. So if we could try and equate those, right? So if we're equating the y coordinates, equating the x coordinates, if they pass intersect, they can just have the same coordinates. They might not have the exact same times, but you can kind of see that these times are not even possible in the first place. So you can say no, will not intersect. All right. So if we have a specific rule defining our motion, so if the plane moves in a plane so that its distance from origin is always 3, i.e. a circle with origin 3, what we can do is we can call this a locus of a point rather than calling it a rule or, you, like, you can call it a rule but rather than calling it a function because it's not necessarily a function. And there can be different loci for the same shape so you can describe it differently. And Normally these are kind of distance based and sometimes they have these points that we talk about that it's like a stuck point and it's moving around it or it's a stuck point moving with two things kind of moving at once and that's how they get the point in the first place. So something like this right so you can see how this triangle is kind of moving along and it's stuck at a fixed point right and it's getting you know further away from that point or closer away from that point you can kind of see how there's those two points right across the x-axis and how these points are kind of changing based on that but we have a fixed point right there cool all right so if we have a Cartesian equation which is equidistant from this point 1 3 and the origin so that's kind of similar to what was happening here right we want those points to be equidistant. So what we want is we want the line of the locus to be PY. And we want them to be equidistant from these two points, right? So what we want is if you can imagine like a line like this, what we're going to have here is we're going to have 0, 0 and the point 1 th root 3. So 1 root 3, let's say it's here. Okay, so those are the two points that we want them to pass through, and we want them to be equidistant. And we, if we think about what is something that's equidistant between those two points, that would be the midpoint of those two points, right? So the midpoint of those two points would be equidistant. But they want an equation here, which means that we're not going to just have a single point. We're going to have multiple points along the line. So what we're actually going to have is instead of just having one point, we're going to have a point along the line. So we're going to have a line which has to pass through that point. And therefore that line is going to bisect the line between those two points, right? So it's going to bisect the line between those two points. Another concept here is it's going to bisect those two lines, but how do we make sure it doesn't sway towards one side or the other? So the answer to that is that we can just find the perpendicular line, right? Because the perpendicular line will always continuously remain at 90 degrees to the line that we're drawing. So I, all in all, if we're trying to find a line which is equidistant between those two points, we need to find the perpendicular bisector of line from 0, 0 to 1, 3. So what that means is that we need to find a couple of things first, right? So we need to find the perpendicular part and the bisector part. So the perpendicular part, we need to find the gradient. So the m equals to root 3 minus 0 over 1 minus 0. So essentially, it's just going to be root 3 as the gradient. So your m, your m perpendicular, right? Your m perpendicular is going to equal to negative 1 on root 3. Okay. Then we need to confirm the bisector component. So in order to find the bisector component, we need to find the midpoint of those two lines. So it's just going to be 1 plus 0 over 2, 
and one, oh sorry, root three plus zero on two. So the midpoint is just going to be a half root three. Okay, so now we have all the information we need because now we're just going to have y minus root three on two will equal to negative one three root three on two times x minus a half. So what we're going to get here is that y will equal to negative one over root three x and we can kind of do we can do like to make it a bit easier for us we can probably times everything by root three at the bottom as well so that we have six there so we'll have that this is going to be it would it would be like plus one on roots two root three so if we times it by root three we'll have plus root 3 on 6 right and we can convert this one as well so we'll have plus 3 root 3 on 6 so y will be equivalent to negative 1 over root 3x and then plus 4 root 3 on 6 which is going to be 4 root 3 on 6 so if we convert it to something a bit nicer we'll get this is root 3 negative root 3 on 3x plus 2 root 3 on 3 as our answer overall. It's a bit squished, sorry. Um, yeah, so that will be our answer overall right there in terms of what, we, what we're going to get. Cool, amazing, really, really good. All right, let's go forward. Alright, so this vector will represent the straight line of motion right, that we have right here. And so we'll move on to talking a little bit about vectors now, um, which is also another topic which can be very, it can be very confusing for people, um, but often is also quite okay overall. Um, oh, just realise, sorry, for the previous, oh, for the previous question, just to make sure that we've, that you can see it, because I realise my camera might be blocking it a little bit so make sure you can actually see so we'll write it out here so we'll write it out here so we'll get that this is going to be y will equal to negative 1 on root 3 x minus a half plus root 3 on 2 so we'll get that this is going to be y will equal to negative root 3 on 3 plus sorry x plus root 3 on 6 plus 3 root 3 on 6 so you'll get that this is going to be y will equal to negative root 3 on 3x plus 4 root 3 over 6. Cool. Now just because I realised that, I'll just make sure that our previous working out was not cut off by anything as well. Um, hopefully it wasn't. And just let me know if there was any problems with understanding any of those. Sorry about that. Alright. So, let's move on to talking about vectors now. So vectors are essentially straight lines of motion and the idea of a vector is we have direction and magnitude involved in both of them. So we both have a direction and we have a magnitude which kind of is equivalent, which forms the idea of a vector. So we've been working in the universe of scalars before which just had a direction, I mean sorry, just had a magnitude but no direction. So essentially it was just this component before rather than the full it was just like, oh, it's a magnitude of three magnitude. You know, we've just been working with like stuff on the number line. Now what we're doing is essentially we're saying that this has a certain direction as well. And what can give it direction is the things that we just started talking about in terms of the angles and what we can do. So this is another way. This is often used more for complex numbers, but you can kind of see how it can be represented that way as well. So a couple ways to represent it and a couple things about it that are important. So you can represent it in this form, which is essentially the 
broken down form into the individual components so the i component shows how much horizontally it's moved and the j component shows how much vertically it's moved another way to represent it is using column vectors so that using our column matrices and if we look at those another way also to represent it is you can also talk about it being between two points so if we talk about the vector from a to vector b essentially what you can say is that it's just the two points minus from each other so that's another way you can talk about it as well the couple things about it so when we're kind of using the magnitude so we're finding the magnitude of the vector what we can do is just using that a squared plus b squared thing for a similar reason to why it worked in polar form if we look back to here if we imagine like a line passing up through here you can kind of think that's going to be the same line that's passing through there and then you can kind of figure out the coordinates from there and draw a triangle to figure out exactly how long that line is cool so in terms of adding or minusing vectors it's pretty it's like you can do it a couple different ways so it's pretty visual in terms of how it works so you can another thing a way that they talk about it is like the head to tail type thing so what you can do is you essentially just go head to tail and then from there it helps you make sure that you're staying in the right direction so you can essentially just go head to tail so what the head part is this part here and the tail part's here so essentially as long as they they connect that's the correct way to add together vectors so you're going from head to tail head to tail and so you can kind of see how this is a plus b whereas this is a minus b and all you have to do from to go from negative to positive is just flip the direction of the vector because now it's going in the opposite direction if you want to add just without the visual component to it as well an easy way to do it is if you have it in the form of like going from this point to this point so for example a b plus a c or something like that right so what you want or how i like to think of it is like this is like my algebra way of the head to tail so what you can do is you just like switch the letters so as long as the letters connect um, it works out so essentially you can have ba plus ac or negative ba plus ac more like because there's the negative component as well uh, but if you kind of, kind of switch that around essentially what you're going to get is that you can see how this ac component would kind of connect together or if you wanted to add those two vectors together right you would have to like move this vector up there so an alternative way to get bc would just be rather than you're going to use those two vectors but you're just going to switch around this direction sorry you're going to switch around the direction of this one so if you wrote this out this would be ba plus ac so you could kind of see how the letters connect there and then if we wanted you know in terms of those two vectors it'll just be negative a b plus a c sorry it would be negative if we wanted the two vectors so if we wanted b c we would just say that it's going to be b a plus a c so you can kind of see how those two letters connect together nicely like that so therefore you're going to have negative a b plus a c cool all right so then another thing with our vectors is this special dot product type thing. So this is essentially called the vector product. Uh, oh, sorry, the dot, pro the scalar product. And there's also another thing called the vector product or the cross product, right? And that's something you're going to learn next year. Um, and it's a new part of the study design, used to not be part of the study design. But essentially it's talking about like a vector which is perpendicular to both vectors. For this year all you have to know about is the dot product and the dot product is really really helpful for what you need to do so it's a special operation for vectors and it's when there's no geometric representation of the dot product so the vector times a vector gives you a number so essentially it's those two times together so another formula that you can use for it is this one and why it's really handy to have both formulas is just like when we were doing for our cosine and sine rules and all that kind of stuff what this actually allows you to do is it means that you're going to be able to find out what the angle is as well because you have two rules and if you can kind of tie them two together you could get the two rules or if you have the angle and they have the magnitudes that's also another way to find it
another important thing that um, is involved in the unit of vectors is that idea of a vector projection. So what a vector projection essentially is, is that it moves in the direction of u and the unit vector is essentially a vector which has the direction of whatever vector it came from, but it has no or a very innocuous magnitude, which is just one, right? Because it's one unit. So essentially it's used in the idea that it's the has still has the direction of what it originally needed to have but now it no longer has the magnitude of it so it can be used in a really helpful context and the most helpful context it's used in is something called vector projections and essentially what a vector projection is is it shows you how far one vector is moving in the direction of another vector so you can get a perpendicular by finding you know minusing a from minusing the a parallel from the a perpendicular because if you imagine that so a parallel a that's a that's the a vector and then if you minus it from there you can kind of imagine the head to tail situation so how you find a parallel is essentially what you're saying is that how far is my vector a moving in the direction of vector b so what that means is essentially you want to find out how far it's traveling and then you want to put it in the direction of vector b so one way an easy way to write it is essentially a dot vector b dot vector dot u dot vector b again because essentially what it is is how far is it moving in the direction of b and because this is a unit vector it won't affect the magnitude of it and then you're going to times it by unit vector b again because you're going to say okay this is the actual direction of b so i'm going to move it in the direction of b and that gives you a vector of how much a is moving in the direction of b in the direction of b so how much it's projecting in that direction so there's a lot of different ways to write it and figure it out and you can use any really any formula you like as long as you're comfortable with it and happy with it but the main thing is that you need to make sure that you you choose one and then just kind of commit to it because the formulas can get a little bit long to do sometimes cool all right so we'll have a parallel will equal to a parallel times vector b a dot b over this so that's another way to write it as well so you can see that there's like hundreds of ways to basically use it um so it's kind of up to you what you want to do and remember the unit vector of b is just going to be vector b over the magnitude of the b vector cool so if we want to find a triangle which has the vertices of um, has these vertices of like a is root 3 plus 1 and then negative 2 4 and then we have the other vertice which is 1 negative 2 3 and c which is 2 negative 2 root 3 plus 3 and you want us to find the area of this triangle essentially what you can do is we can use this area equation that we found before so that area equation that we've used and what we want to do is we'll get a half a b b c times root one minus cos angle of sine angle of cos squared and why we want to use this angle is because it will be the it'll be the easiest one for us to find in terms of the actual angle component of it. So we can find what AB is. So AB is going to essentially just be AO plus OB. So AO plus OB. So it's going to be the negative of whatever this is plus this part. So it's going to be 1 minus root 3 plus 1. Then it's going to be negative 2 minus negative 2. Then it's going to be 3 minus our 4, right? So we're going to end up with root 3 plus 0 j minus k. And then similarly for the bc component, we're going to have this is going to be bo plus oc. So it's going to be bo, which is negative 1 plus 2. So that's going to be 1. Then we're going to get negative 2 negated, which is 2. So 2 plus negative 2 is 0. And then we're going to get 3, negative 3 plus root plus <laughs> negative 3 plus 3 root 3 <laughs> negative 3 plus 3 plus root 3 which the negative 3 and the 3 are going to cancel out and you're going to just get left with root 3 so then what you're going to get here is we've already found out what these two components are and now the next part we need to find out what our cos value is so our cos value is going to be our ab over b ab times bc over root 
A, B, B, C. So we can times that in and what we want is if we times those two. So we're going to times these two and then divide by the magnitudes of each of them. So what that means is in this process, we will need to find the magnitudes and do that as well. So we can kind of do that in our process now. And so what we're going to say is we could say magnitude of AB is going to equal to root 3, negative root 3 squared plus 0 squared plus negative 1 squared. So that's going to be root of 3 plus 1, so i.e. 2. And it's going to be the same for this one. And then if we multiply across, what we're going to get here is that it's going to just be negative root 3 minus root 3. And what that's going to give us is negative 2 root 3 at the top. So if we kind of move to the next slide, we can kind of see how that was introduced. So our negative 2 over root 3, and our 2 times 2, which is going to just give us negative root 3 on 2 as our angle. So what we can do is we can plug that in and we'll get that this is negative root 3 plugged in there. So we'll get that the angle is going to just be 1 plus essentially oh, 1 minus 3 on 4, which is going to be 1 fourth. So it's going to be a half in there. So we'll essentially have half times 2 times 2 times a half, which will just give you an area overall of 1. Alright, so let's talk about doing a vector resolute now as well and how we can find our vector resolute equations. So they want us to find the vector resolute between A and B and if the magnitude of B is 3 units and the angle between A and B is pi and 3, they want us to find the vector resolute of B in the direction of A. So what we can do here is essentially we can just put in that so that we can talk about the different formulas that we can use here. So we can use A dot unit vector B dot unit vector B, right? So that's one way to do it. Or alternatively, you can do A dot B over B dot B. So that's another way you can also represent that same vector or a parallel vector. And then you can also do, some people also like to do it's equivalent to a dot b over unit vector b squared dot b, like that. So there's a couple of different ways to do it, and it's up to you which way you want to do it, essentially. Um, either or is fine, whichever thing you're most comfortable with. So let's write, well, I like the one where you do the unit vector B part. So I'm going to go unit vector. Actually, I like this one. So I like to go like a parallel, a parallel will equal to a dot B over B modulus squared dot B. I like to do that one because I think it's the easiest. So if the magnitude of B is three, so B equals to three. And the angle between A and B is pi and 3. So if we're looking at this part, so A dot B will equal to unit vector A, unit vector B, or not unit vector, sorry, modulus A, modulus B, cos pi on 3. And we want to find the vector resolute of A in the direction of B, right? So we can put that in so that we, we want to find what A, therefore the unit vector of A is going to be. It's sorry, the unit vector, the modulus of A. So that's going to be 4 squared plus 5 squared, which is going to just equal to 16 plus 25, which is going to equal to root 41. So essentially, A dot B is going to equal to root 41 times 3 times cos pi 3, which is going to just be a half. Okay, so that's going to be 3 root 41 over 2. So if we kind of plug that boat back into the process there, we'll get that this is going to be 3 root 41 over 2 over b squared, which is going to be 9, and then times our b vector. So all in all, what we're going to get here is a parallel is going to be equivalent to our 3 root 41 over 18 times our b vector, which is going to be b i and then j i vector resolute plus b 
bi plus bj. Okay, so that means that we actually need to find what the vector b is as well, right? So, we've gotten some information about exactly what's going on um, in terms of like the a and b, right? And they've told us that the the angle, the value of between a and b is going to be exactly that. So if we can do this as well, we'll get that that this will be four b, four b plus five b essentially will equal to our vector a, vector b, cos theta. And now look, that's the other way that we can represent it, right? And we know what a is, we know what b is, we just found that. So we know that this is going to be 3 root 41 over 2 is going to be essentially 9b. So b is going to equal to uh, 3 root 41 odd 18. Which could, coincidentally is actually this the same value here as well so that's kind of a bit funny but essentially what we're going to get here is we can substitute now that back in so we'll get a parallel will equal to 3 root 41 on 18 essentially times 3 root 41 on 18 times i plus j so if we could substitute that in now what we'll get is going to be it's going to be root 41 squared so it be 41 times 9 on 18 times 18, which is just going to give us 41 on 36. 36. Uh, and then we're going to have i plus j. Cool. So another... Oh, I keep on doing that. I'm so sorry, guys. I'll just rewrite that bit. Let's rewrite that bit. So we'll get that a parallel will equal to root forty three root forty one times three root forty one, which we worked out to be uh, forty one on thirty six. And then we can put that into that bit as well. So we'll get that this is going to be just i plus j. Now, sometimes in other questions as well, they are also ask you for like the perpendicular component because it's another thing that they can do as well. So they ask you for like, oh, what's the perpendicular component or what's the shortest distance possible, etc. So if they do ask you for that, another thing you can do is you can, let's write, white out what's on this page so we draw that we draw that a parallel was equal to 41 on 36 um, of i plus j so sometimes they ask you for like the shortest distance which is a bit ambiguous but essentially what it means is it wants the magnitude of a perpendicular to b sorry perpendicular to b so what that means for us is all we have to do here is just go a minus a perpendicular to b and what that's going to give us here is it's going to give us 4 minus 41 over 36 i plus 5 minus 41 over 36 j so what we're going to get here is that if we times that by 36 there'll be 72 144 so 144 minus 41 over 36 i and then plus 180 minus 41 over 36 j so what we're going to get here is it's just going to be 103 on 36 i plus you often get really awkward numbers for this just because of the the way that it's found um, 139 on 36 j 
and then they want the magnitude of it so we can just say the shortest distance a perpendicular to b is going to be equivalent to root of 1 on 3 over 36 squared plus 139 over 36 squared which if we work that out in our calculators 103 squared plus 139 squared over 36 squared rooted will give us that it'll be root 200 oh sorry 29,930 over 36 so that will be the shortest distance between a and b cool last type of bits are talking about your vector proofs and what's in most important for your vector proofing is that you have a good system of num good system of the geometry properties already so that's really really important and like kind of vital i guess to this so it's vital that you have a good understanding of all the geometry properties involved in just basically everything so what i would recommend is like a table or like a sheet with all the geometry stuff so stuff that comes up really commonly like i mentioned before is like circles and par parallelograms they really love them in proofing and vectors for some reason you'll see them in you know three four v car exams you'll see them basically spread out essentially everywhere so it's really important that you can, can get them down early and easily and that way you just have all the rules on hand and become comfortable with using them they also like triangles a lot as well here so it's important that you know all your geometric rules for triangles so you know your basic rules and your kind of more advanced rules as well so the rules that we just talked about in terms of that sine cos type thing cool all right so let's do that there so we'll draw out our diagonals So they want the diagonals of a parallelogram to bisect each other. So what we know about a parallelogram is in the simplest manner, we know that it's parallel in terms of the opposite sides. So it goes up here and it goes up here, it goes here and it goes here, right? So we know that those components are, that's the kind of essential components of it. We also know that for a parallelogram, opposite sides are so opposite sides are equal and parallel. And that's our main thing, right? So what we can do here is just essentially just label our sides with like letters. So we can say this is A, B, C, D. And that way we can kind of talk about the thing. So we know that A, D will be equal to B, C. And a b will be equal to d c so that's our ideas and then they want us to prove that those parallel the diagonals bisect each other so essentially we can kind of draw a line from a to c and then we can draw a line from b to d and we want to prove that this point x right is going to bisect that line there so what we can do is because they bisect each other we can just say that we can assume that there is a log AC, this point X, which sits there already and will bisect that. And our goal is to try and prove that that point also bisects that line BD. So what we're going to get here is that we're going to get that firstly, AC is going to be equivalent to our, let's say BA plus our AD. Right? Oh, sorry, AC. Let's rub that out. So our B, AC is going to be equivalent to our AB <laughs> plus our BC. So that's where our line is going to be and therefore we're saying let x be midpoint let x be midpoint of ac right so what we're going to get here is ac is going to equal to a half ab 
plus BC. And that's going to be our line already, right? So then what we can do here is now we've found what AC is, sorry, AX is. And we can kind of leave that as is. Now, now what we want to find is what BD is. So BD is going to be equivalent to our BA plus our AD. Now we want to make these all equivalent to each other, right? So that it's just easier for us to do. So rather than saying AD here, we can replace that with BC because AD was equivalent to BC. So essentially it's going to be negative AB plus BC, right? In, in order to get this diagonal here. So then what we can do here is essentially we can just put that in because now we have this value that we can just work with that we don't need to worry about uh, we don't like now we have everything in terms of the thing so we don't really need to worry about all of this type of stuff anymore so now what we need to find is we need to find what bx is going to be so bx is going to be bd plus da right oh sorry bx plus ax what am i talking about uh, let me just rub that out. So it's going to be BD. Well, let's go actually, yeah, let's go BA. So no, it's going to be BA plus our AX that we found before in order to find it, right? So you can see how the A's connect there. So therefore our BA uh, is going to be B, our BA is going to be our, we can get that from essentially this part here. So BA is going to just be negative AB plus our AX, which is going to be minus plus one half AB plus BC. So we can say that's going to be now negative one half AB plus one half BC and I will stop writing there so that I can so our BX will be negative a half AB plus a half BC which we can kind of see is going to be just negative one half of or a half, sorry, of negative AB plus BC. So essentially, it's just going to be a half of our BD. So therefore, X is also midpoint of BD. So therefore, we can kind of say that the diagonals of the parallelogram bisect each other because essentially the midpoint of that one was the midpoint of that one as well. All the Alright, so this last question here is about triangles. So, prove that the altitude of a triangle is the perpendicular bisector to the opposite side. So, if the altitude of the triangle is the perpendicular bisector of the opposite side, that this triangle is an isosceles triangle. So, we've drawn our A, B, C here for our isosceles triangle and what we're going to have here is essentially we're going to have our point x right so our perpendicular bisector so this is perpendicular and it bisects our thing so we know that this is also the altitude of the triangle so it's like the proper length of the triangle so it's exactly in half and it splits the triangle into two equal sections right so we also know that these angles would also be the same because this is the altitude of the triangle. So it goes, it well, it the like it's the perpendicular bisector of the triangle. So it bisects the angle. And then also another part about it being the altitude of the triangle would mean that it it's perpendicular in the first place, right? So I guess the altitude part and the perpendicular bisector part kind of mean the perpendicular part is kind of the same thing but in terms of it bisecting this means that this side and this side is the same so what that we can gather from that is that 
AX will equal to CX, sorry, XC, or equal to negative CX. And we also know that BX times AX will equal to zero. So that's kind of the two conclusions we can get from that. So we need to use that to prove that this side here is going to be an isosceles well these two sides here are essentially going to be the same so we want to prove these two sides are the same so our goal is to prove that AC will be AB will equal to CB okay cool so in order to get to AB what we can do is we can try to find what BX is plus AX right and what we can do from there is that if our bx plus our ax is, so that's what's going to be exactly our kind of thing there. And we know that our ax is just going to be our half ac. So we're going to get bx plus a half ac. Right? And then what we want to find out is find out what our bc is. So our bc is, is going to be bx plus our xc. Right? So what we could get from here is that because it's BX plus XC, once again, it's going to be BX plus a half AC. Because it's the bisecting of that point, right? So once we can get that, we can kind of see that therefore, we'll get that AB is equivalent to BC. So therefore, they're going to be that this is uh, isosceles triangle. So we isosceles triangle, right? Alternatively, another way you can do this as well, so rather than going this way and this way, you can also talk about the angles within there as well. So you can also, like, if the, you didn't need to prove this in the context of vectors, another option to talk about proving this and doing this is essentially it's pretty relatively also straightforward in terms of what you do, right? All you need to do here is essentially say that you have angle BXA is equal to angle BXC, right? And you know that because of that, because of that fact, you also know that angle BX, oh sorry, B, this equals to 90 degrees, and you also know that B, angle ABX equals to angle A or X X B C right so those two angles essentially that and that angle equal so therefore you know another thing is that 180 will equal to angle B X A plus angle A B X so those two angles plus let's say angle A right and that also means that this is equivalent to 180 is also equivalent to angle BXC plus angle XBC plus angle A. And those two are equivalent, right? So if you convert that to this angle, sorry, angle C. So if you equate that to the different things and you go 1 minus 2, what you'll get is angle A minus angle C will equal to 0. So you'll get angle A will equal to angle C. So that's another way to prove it if you didn't want to use vectors to do this proof. Um, cool. Alright. So that comes to the end of this lecture. Uh, sorry for the troubles with the video and stuff, but essentially what we're going to be looking at, um, sorry, what we looked at in the past two hours is a little bit about trig. So importantly, looking about trig in terms of the functions and right angle triangles. So all the cos, sine, tan functions, all of the coordinate system things, all of those types of things of above. Um, and then we also talked about the triangles in the context of having non-right angles and using the cosine, the sine rule and areas to find specific things about triangles. And we also saw how that was applicable in the context of vectors as well. We talked about coordinate systems and kind of touched on, vaguely touched on what you might see in complex numbers and how we can use the idea of parametric equations to help us find equations or help us to describe relations. 
Then we talked a little bit about vectors. So the main things about vectors is how to add them, how to plus them, how to do the dot products, how to find unit vectors, and how to do vector projections. And you can all use all of that information to help you find and do vector proofing, which is one of the banes of many people's existences. So kind of building up those skills and making sure you have the geometry properties to back them up is really important. So just remember that the, the stuff we learned today is actually relatively high yield in terms of going forward for this year and going forward for next year in terms of complex numbers, vectors, trig, all of that stuff is stuff that comes up again and again. But just remember to chip away at it slowly. Complex numbers and vectors are two very new systems and the idea of parametric equations is also very new. So get a bit of understanding now and just kind of chip away at it so that once you relearn it next year because they'll kind of take you from the start again next year that you'll be more comfortable with the concepts involved and more comfortable with the terms and stuff that they use cool so i think we'll stick her i think i'll stick around for a bit more questions if anybody has any and i'll answer them all but otherwise thanks so much for coming um and listening to this lecture and good luck with everything and see you all around